Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to Will and Jane 2.0 Classics Updated with Sayantani Dasgupta and Brittany N. Williams. This is very exciting. Give them a warm welcome. Hi. I'm Yang. I'm an anchor at NBC4. And like you, I'm here because I love books. I love reading and I love talking to authors and finding out what's behind their big brains because <laughs> writing books and being this creative and creating these universes onto pages that take us to places where we don't even have to leave our couches is to me one of the best talents to have. So I love authors. They are rock stars. This is my 15th year participating in the Book Fest. Isn't that wild? Oh, wow. That, that's how much I love this event. I really do. Um, thank you to the stage sponsors, the volunteers who make this happen, the stage manager, and of course the tech crews who do so much work behind the scenes as well. So thank you everyone. Um, I am really excited to talk to two authors who are turning classics on their heads, so to speak. Uh, Sayantani is the best-selling author of Kiran Mala and the Kingdom Beyond series and two other series set in the Kingdom Beyond multiverse, the Fire Queen series, the Secret of the Sky series. She is a pediatrician by training and a team member of We Need Diverse Books. We're going to talk about her newest book, Rosewood, A Midsummer Meet Cute. I have a teenage girl. I know all about meet cutes, <laughs> right? Come on. Um, Brittany is a classically trained actor and studied musical theater at Howard University. H U, you know. Welcome back to DC. <laughs> You know, we weren't going to let you go without talking about being in D.C., being back in D.C. Um, and Shakespearean performance at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London. She's been a principal vocalist at Hong Kong Disneyland, appeared on TV series. Her short stories have been featured in several publications. That self-same medal is her debut young adult novel. And they're both professors. And they just do all these things. And every time I talk to others, I think, why am I not doing more with my life? What am I doing? Here? Like, get on it, lady. OK. Um, before we begin, a couple of things. Uh, we're going to have a chance to talk to the authors after this presentation. So you may have a burning question about Joan or Isla. If not, you might have one by the time we're finished talking. And we will have time for Q&A. And the book signing with the authors 1.30 to 2.30. So if you want your book signed, 1.30 to 2.30. All right. So let's get going. So first of all, we just want to start with the question about what inspired you to write a book like the one that you wrote in terms of revamping a classic. Scientine, we'll start with you. Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I have always wanted to come to the National Book Festival, and this is my first time Yay! here. So yeah. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Oh, and I see so many friends um, and, of course, family in the audience. Um, so it's really delightful to be here and to be able to share my nerdery with you because I, too, am a huge book lover, as I'm sure all of us here are. Um, when I was 12, my mother hands me a copy of Pride and Prejudice. It's the summer. We're in India. My cousins are busy. It's hot. It's hot. I have read all the Nancy Drews I have brought with me. <laughs> they are done, right? Um, the Hardy Boys, uh, I was not such a fan, but I read those too, right? I'm bored. It's done. She hands me this book, and I think, this is a didactic book that my mom is trying to sneak into my hands. I am not going to read this book. It, she's telling me, don't be prideful. Don't be prejudiced by handing me this book. Um, so I tell her, I'm not going to read that. At night, I'm bored. I start to read it, and I realize, oh, this is a really good book. <laughs> this is a book about five sisters, and there's romance, and there's balls. I love balls. Um, and there's dresses, and there's friendship and finding yourself. And I became, from that day forward, a bona fide Jane Austen fanatic. I did not tell my mom, I think she might know, because I've written <laughs> two Jane Austen adaptations. I think she might have gleaned um, that she was successful in uh, giving me those books. But of course, the flip side of that is um, I adored these books. I've read all the Austens over and over and over again. But of course, I never exactly saw myself in them. I saw my aspects of myself in them, but just not my whole self. 
And um, so during the pandemic, I wrote my first ad Austin adaptation, Debating Darcy. Um, I was terrified to write it because again, this was my favorite book in the world. Could I do it justice? Could I put characters who looked like me in this story, stay true to the heart of what I loved about Austin, but still bring something utterly unique to it? Um, so I ended, because, and because it was 2020, we were all doing brave things in 2020. Some of us were bacon bread. <laughs> I know some of you all had smelly sourdough starter in your kitchen. Um, and I was writing this book that I never thought I'd be brave enough to write. Um, it was the book I needed to read, so I wrote it. And then subsequently, ooh, um, subsequently I ended up writing Rosewood, which is Sense and Sensibility meets um, Shakespeare meets Bridgerton. It is about two sisters um, at a summer theater camp, not unlike a Shakespeare camp, um, but at this particular camp, it is Regency camp. And they are scouting for extras for a Bridgerton-like, kind of multiculturally cast Regency show. And hijinks and romance ensue. Um, and so again, these were the novels that were in my heart that I wanted to write, that I wanted to see characters like myself in these beloved tales. Um, but it took me, I'm not 12 anymore. It took me a lot of years to find the courage to do it. Um, but now I get to share them with all of you, so it's really a delight. Well, we're glad you, we're glad you did. Yes. And Brittany, your book is very specific. I mean, yeah. yeah. So tell me about the inspiration behind your book. Yeah, so um, I've been a Shakespeare fan since elementary school. I, I tell. I mean, right? <laughs> Y'all who are in the green room, I was going deep into the Shakespeare nerdery, like deep, deep. Love it. Um, but uh, yeah, I used to watch Shakespeare the Animated Tales on HBO, 7 a.m. every Saturday. Loved it. <laughs> wow. It's like 24 minute long um, cuts of the plays done in different animation styles. Fantastic. BBC did it. If you find the DVDs, watch them. They're great. Um, so I love that. Uh, I did my first school play when I was 10 and I decided I wanted to be an actor from then. And if I wanted to be an actor, I wanted to do Shakespeare. And one thing I kept bumping into throughout all of this love I had for this amazing playwright was that um, I kept being told that I had to play a servant because that's who I would have been back then. Or um, I couldn't play any of the larger roles. Even in grad school at Central, uh, myself and the other two uh, non-white actors in my group we were given these small parts and we were told we should be grateful because those are the parts we'll play in the real world. Um, uh. Right, right. Uh, and then also fighting against this idea that black people were invented for slavery. So we didn't exist in any place except for like Africa pre um, 1619 or um, that you know there was a, it, there was a time when England and London was this like bastion of only white people, um, and I wanted to fight those uh, misconceptions with this book by very firmly placing black people and people of color in London in 1605, um, and I also wanted to very firmly place queer people in London in 1605 because there's this idea that queer people were invented in the 90s and we're like <laughs> this new fad. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that any other person, um, any other person of color and specifically any other black girl who found herself loving this thing um, had some ammunition to fight back when people told her she didn't have a place there. Mm. So. Oh, it's so emotional. <laughs> Sorry. No. It's, it's so emotional because you grow up and you never see yourself yeah. right. featured in books. Mm -mm. Um, and you can't aspire to be that if you don't see it. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that, and that's why these books are so important. Mm -hmm. um, as a mother, too, it makes me emotional. Okay, so yeah. all, right. <laughs> all right. You're talking to two moms, too, yeah, so we yeah, understand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and their moms. Um, let's, can you read a little bit from your book? Bring yes, up, absolutely. Okay. All right. So I can get myself together and, like, <laughs> yeah. Listen, it's all good. Mm. Okay. Excellent, Shakespeare said as he strolled out on stage. He smoothed his black hair back down into a low ponytail, his shirt tucked haphazardly into his trousers. Burbage squinted at the other man before turning to Joan. With the lines last, Joan's grin broke across her face, but her heart thumped hard in her chest. I with the lines, it would help both of you to show one expertise this day. How could she say no to a private performance by Shakespeare and Burbage? 
Burbage's broad laugh echoed through the empty playhouse, and Shakespeare grinned at her as they moved to their starting positions. Go have speed this first time. Joan placed her sword at her feet and girded up her skirt, tying the loose fabric at either side of her waist on the chance that she'd need to demonstrate some moves. You can never be sure with these two, but Joan kept that thought to herself. She snatched up Bea again and stepped toward the back of the stage, digging the sword's point into the wood floor. She laid her hands across the hilt. To give you a chance to fix yourselves before I do it for you. Both men snorted and squared off with each other. They held gazes for a long moment doing nothing, the air between them seeming to suddenly spark with a dangerous energy. Joan frowned. You can begin. Don't you want to get to the alehouse? Come on, sir, Burbage said. Come, my lord, Shakespeare replied. He swung for Burbage's neck, an opening move that Joan did not remember teaching them. Burbage leaned back, the blow whistling through the air where his neck had been before striking out with his own sword. Shakespeare spun out of the way a second too late. Joan saw the split in his sleeve slowly turning red with blood. One, Burbage said. What was happening? Hold, she shouted. None of this is what I taught you. Burbage stabbed his sword at Shakespeare. Joan watched it catch the taller man along the stomach, ripping his shirt but not splitting the skin. Judgment, Burbage shouted, speaking Hamlet's lines even as the two men fought in earnest. Hold, she yelled, both of you hold. Shakespeare ripped his blade along Burbage's arm, more blood drawn. That was enough. Joan lifted Bea and ran toward the two men. She slipped between them, knocking their swords away with two heavy blows. What's the matter with you? Hold means stop or have you forgotten? Burbage stumbled a bit, then stared straight at Joan. She tensed. His eyes shone like they had during the show, held a deadly glint he'd never aimed at her before today. She glanced over at Shakespeare and saw a matching sharpness in his gaze. So it hadn't been Bea pushing them after all. Joan shifted her stance as they each took a step toward her. Let's say that's enough for today. Burbage charged forward, rushing into her space before she was ready. Joan dropped to one knee as his blade sliced the air over her head. She pivoted, swinging her blade up to parry his blow. The strength of it rattled her bones and sent her tumbling backward. Shakespeare appeared above her as she hit the stage, his sword raised over his head. She threw herself to the side as the blow rang against the stage behind her. God's crown! She scrambled to her feet, holding her sword out in front of herself and trying to keep both men in sight. I said, stop! Judgment, Burbage said again. A hit, Shakespeare said, a very palpable hit. They rushed her, suddenly working in sync. She parried Shakespeare's cut, knocking his blade against Burbage's. She kept moving, rolling along Shakespeare's back and dancing out of range. Burbage jerked forward, swiping at her wildly. His steps landed clumsily as he tried to keep up with her faster footwork. Joan dodged a heavy blow, felt her heels slip off the edge of the stage and threw herself forward to keep from falling down into the dirt. She dove over a wild swing from Shakespeare and tucked her head, rolling across the stage. She let the movement push her to her feet smoothly and caught a glimpse of a slim man standing half obscured by one of the painted columns, his dark, his dark brown skin glowing. <laughs> Thank you. So I just have to point out that I don't know if you have my view here. Um, will you please hold up that bookmark? Oh, yes. Because <laughs> I got to see her bookmark. Yes, it is a lovely sword bookmark. Ooh, that yes, matches yes. her sword yes. earring. Yes. <laughs> just want to do a little product placement. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I would love to. So um, exciting. Right. So uh, a little different in tone. For me, um, <laughs> for me, the thing I love about Austin is, yes, the romance, but it's also the wit, right? It's also mm -hmm. that bubbly, delightful wit that she uses. And she uses sentences like swords to kind of critique, you know, issues from gender to class to inheritance laws. And so in my book, you know, those issues are expanded to include kind of imperialism, racism, colorism. Um, but the scene I'm about to read you is just the wit. Um, <laughs> I'll read you uh, a section from Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility, and then I will read you just a bit of my interpretation of that scene. So if you all remember, uh, in Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility, it's about an older sister who acts like a, you know, even though she's not an immigrant, Eleanor acts like a firstborn immigrant daughter. So Ela. I'm a firstborn immigrant right? daughter. I really can. <laughs> Really, Ela, and this book is dedicated to firstborn immigrant daughters. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, a very kind of pragmatic firstborn immigrant daughter and a second daughter who is like Marianne, our character Malika here, is wild and embracing life and the romance of life. So in Jane Austen's original, um, Marianne falls down a hill and this is what happens. 
A gentleman was passing up the hill when her accident happened. He ran to her assistance. She raised herself from the ground, but her foot had been twisted in her fall, and she was scarcely able to stand. The gentleman offered his services, and perceiving that her modesty declined what her situation rendered necessary, took her up in his arms without further delay and carried her down the hill. Jane Austen, Sense and Sensibility. In our uh, summer regency camp, the character Malika does not accidentally fall down the hill. She purposefully tumbles down a hill into a lake <laughs> in order to create the most drama possible, in order to attract the attention of the actor who she thinks is secretly among the uh, campers, uh, kind of seeing which woman he has the most chemistry with. So uh, this is the character Ela, is the eye voice. Malika, I yelled, running down the hill after my fallen sister. Now, if you've never run down a hill in tiny Regency boots and straight skirts, I don't recommend it. Because the next thing I knew, I tripped and would have fallen right down the hill like a Jill to her Jack, had Brandon and Annie not stopped me. Uh, I'll just skip forward. Attention, attention, said a voice through some kind of hidden speaker system. We all looked around, confused. We have a lady fallen into the lake incident at the North Lakeside Croquet <laughs> Station. The voice then changed in tone, going on. All the croquet players, please wrap up play and make your way indoors for a table lesson, which will commence in 30 minutes. Confused about your salad fork? Always wondered which direction to drag your spoon while eating soup? <laughs> Discover all these secrets and more at Table Lessons. This announcement was made with such casualness, it made me wonder if gowned and gloved ladies falling into bodies of water was going to be an everyday occurrence at Regency Camp. As we all watched, my sister Malika flailed about in the lake. At first I panicked, thinking her clothes were somehow caught on something because my sister was a strong swimmer. I mean, her butterfly stroke could use a little work, but <laughs> this was not a girl who should be flailing about in any sort of body of water. That's when I realized she was doing it on purpose. Assistance, please someone lend me their kind assistance, she wailed, while making the most enormous splashing with her flopping arms. It sounded like she was trying to approximate a British accent, <laughs> but failing in the process. <coughs> oh dear, oh dear, woe is me. I have fallen all kerploppy into the lake. <laughs> Our entire group looked at me as if Malika was speaking an unfamiliar foreign language, and I, the tour-appointed translator. Kerploppy? Brandon's bushy eyebrows were raised high. Into the lakey? Asked Annie, her voice thick. Really? Um, and then the character she's been trying to get the attention of comes to her rescue, as one expects. Never fear, lady, never fear, for will is nigh, will is near, <laughs> shouted the boy my sister had been trying to attract, removing an alarming number of articles of clothing as he <laughs> ran from his side of the lake. As he shed each piece, like a tree shedding leaves, there arose collective sighs and gasps from the onlookers of all genders on all sides of the water. His jacket, gasp, his cravat, shriek, his vest, Whoa. He had just flung aside his white shirt and dived into the lake when there arose the loudest collective exclamation from everyone watching the scene. <laughs> both, both passages so interesting and fun and makes you want to read more. Clearly, Brittany, the research. <laughs> I don't even begin to know. We know you fell in love with Shakespeare at an early mm -hmm. age, but talk about that writing process, the research you have to yeah. do to create this world and even make Shakespeare one of your characters. Yeah, so one thing about um, performing Shakespeare, I personally like to um, understand the history of when the play was written. There are like these three layers of history whenever you do a Shakespeare piece. There's uh, the time in which the play is set, the time in which the play was written, and then the time in which you are presenting the play. Uh, so I've, you know, in my performance, uh, I've studied so much of Shakespeare's time, um, how it would have been performed at the Globe, what their life was like. Um, so I had this like already layer of knowledge and then I just kind of dove even deeper trying to understand, okay, so what would a day look like? Um, the hard part, <laughs> it's hard because there aren't a lot of written records left because the whole city of London burned down in 1666. Um, but, uh, 
I like researched what they would drink. Everyone would drink ale because water wasn't clean enough to be potable. So even children drink, they called it small ale. So it was like less, like less strong. So thinking about like, okay, so it was mostly, Shakespeare's audience would have been mostly illiterate and also slightly buzzed at all times. <laughs> Um, so that makes the, a lot of the choices in the plays make so much more sense. Um, and I just, you know, uh, reading about clothing, um, I had written a draft of the book and then I found this wonderful research book called uh, Labor's Lost that was all about the contributions of women to early modern theater. And you usually only hear that, oh, well, in Shakespeare's time, it was only men. Women weren't involved at all. But women were taking money at the front of the theaters. They maintained the books. Uh, there were women who were invested in the theaters and helped buy like the costumes and maintain the buildings. Uh, of course, women maintained the costumes. They were dressers backstage. So that made me go back to my draft and make sure that I had inserted women where they belonged because we're so often left out of history um, because a lot of women's work is so um, disregarded. So uh, there were these characters that I had made men and I was like, nope, all of these are women. I just, they're women now. So that was great. That's awesome. um, and uh, I have a background in stage combat. So that really helped me when I was writing my fights. And I keep a practice rapier in my office when I work. So, as right. one does. <laughs> right. right, as you have to. Right. As one does. So I, like, practice I would. Practice rapier in your closet yes. at work? Do you in not my, have a office. practice rapier? Right. I have to get one. At a rapier and dagger. Um, <laughs> Putting so, one in the studio. Right. It's, uh, it's, so I, I'll do some of the moves to make sure they make sense. Because every once in a while, you know, with fights, as with sexy scenes, sometimes there that dreaded third hand may creep in, mm -hmm. you know. So um, y'all know what I'm talking about. It'll be like, oh, he held her face closely and he caressed her cheek and he held her hand, and it's like, where this other hand? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, you know, I'll do the moves and make sure they make sense. And um, and like as a person who loves fights, like I love watching fights, I love reading about fights and everything. That that made it. Those were my like favorite parts to research and write. Gosh, I love it. Um, just real quick, you touched upon the fact that you said most of the audience were literate. Yeah. And what that means for the people who mm -hmm. are supposed to enjoy Shakespeare. Yeah, so he was writing for the common people. Um, he was writing for an audience, like I said, of mostly illiterate folks. Uh, he didn't write his plays to be printed. Uh, the majority of them weren't even printed until well after his death. The first folio, which is the like first large collection of Shakespeare's plays put to print actually didn't come out until 1623, so this year is the 400th anniversary. You could check out some first folios around DC, the Folger has some. Um, and Shakespeare died in 1616, so this was well after his death. Uh, even the actors, when they would rehearse the plays, you would get something called a prompt script. So it would have only your lines and then the three words that came before. So there wasn't a complete like collection of the plays ever because they didn't want it to be stolen. Like you would do Hamlet at the Globe on Monday and then if somebody got a hold of the script on Wednesday, they'd be doing like ham loot over the <laughs> Hamlet. So, right? <laughs> ham light. Uh, so it's like we, we have this and the, the, the idea that he was this like elevated figure who's only for intellectuals didn't come about until later when people started using his works as a bludgeon instead of this like yes. common thing for enjoyment. Like honestly, the contemporary writer who I think he's closest to is Tyler Perry when it comes to like stage plays. Cause he wrote things for the, like for audiences who loved them and for people who, you know, who couldn't read, who, uh, not to say Tyler Perry's audience can't read because they absolutely can, but just for, he wrote to the people. He didn't write for uh, academia. He wrote for the people and the people loved it. And we still do. That's why the plays are still around 400 years later. Love it, love it. Scientani, what you also do so well, which is what Jane Austen does, is the dialogue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to be funny is so hard. To be funny in a book and to have somebody laugh out loud is even harder. Can you talk about how you put that into a, a living work in terms of a book. <laughs> it really, you know what I mean? The dialogue is no, what it always is. gets me it's about really Jane Austen's funny. books. I'm a very voice-driven writer, and I don't know, what, what comes first, let me ask you a question, what comes mm -hmm. first for you? Is it the plot or is it the character? Um, the, or plot, the plot and then the characters kind of come together, but it's, and then dialogue comes like immediately after mm. and then setting comes absolutely last. Mm. 
so for me, it's it's always voice, and I can't it, I can't begin to write something unless I can hear that character in my head. Um, so I've written middle grade fantasies, but you know most of them are first person, very snarky young twelve year old. Like what a twelve year old contemporary twelve year old would sound like. Okay, yes, she's a twelve year old who's an intergalactic demon slayer, but she's also just, <laughs> she's also a twelve year old right. from Jersey, right? And twelve year olds from Jersey sound a certain way. Mm -hmm. Similarly, these sisters are sixteen, seventeen year olds, kind of. Also, all my books are set in New Jersey because, right, as, as we know, <laughs> everything strange happens in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, these sisters are also kind of from the East Coast, teenagers in a contemporary setting, um, and their voices had to come to me. And mm -hmm. this distinction between um, a, a very responsible first-born immigrant daughter's voice and a over-the-top, ridiculous, loving of life uh, second daughter's voice had to be distinct. Mm -hmm. And then of course, both of these characters have growths that go in the opposite direction. The older sister learns how to kind of let go and the younger sister learns how to take care. And so even, so as you're writing, you're keeping these voices distinct, but they're having separate character arcs. So you gotta make sure they stay distinct. Um, and then, you know, the, the humor I think comes from just knowing your characters deeply and knowing their foibles deeply and being completely willing to put them in settings and in yep. situations that like tap right into those <laughs> weak spots. Yeah. Like, oh, you're a ham who's going to show off for the cute boy at camp? Here's a lake. Maybe you could throw <laughs> right. yourself into it, you know? Um, so it's kind of about uh, being a little merciless with my characters, putting mm -hmm. them in situations where their tender spots come out. But in those in those moments, uh, there's humor, but there's also kind of character growth and development. Mm -hmm. And in your reading of Jane Austen, what have, what did you learn in terms of what you wanted to put out there, and what what you wanted to in terms of like a love letter to this favorite author mm. of yours? I wanted to kind of use sentences like swords. I wanted to, I do not have a practice rapier <laughs> in my office. We can get you oh, one, it's all right. Although I'm thinking about it. You need to do a whole line. I've decided. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Custom swords. Right, exactly. So, but metaphorically, right, I wanted to kind of sharpen the dialogue and um, make sure that I made room for, uh, you know, the Bechdel test, which is oh, yes. you want women characters or, you know, uh, gender minority characters to be in a situation where they're with one another, they're not talking about men, um, right? And they're talking to one another about other topics. And so I wanted to kind of uh, do what Austin does, which is create these spaces where women can kind of talk about vulnerabilities and talk about uh, frustrations and be themselves deeply and thoroughly. Um, that said, the one thing I did wanna say kind of that ties to you is, um, there's a lot of Shakespeare in this book as well. And it's mm -hmm. because I am a Shakespeare performance lover, particularly it's still summer, y'all. There are beautiful outdoor Shakespeare performances. And I wanted to give the book that frothy feeling of mm. the sun's coming down, the lightning bugs are out, the actors are coming up over the hill. And Yes, you know, it's summer and you're a contemporary kid on a blanket with your friends or your family, but suddenly you're transported and mm -hmm. it's magic. And I wanted to give the book that feeling um, that you have when you see live theater mm -hmm. that transports you like that. Um, so both Jane Austen and The Wit, but also kind of that summer theater feeling of mm -hmm. being free and being in your imagination and kind of being able to be your full self. Um, out there in public. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. And I think that's what books do for us. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite Shakespeare performance that you've watched, both of you? Because you love both of you love Shakespeare performances. <laughs> I think we might say the same one. Let's see. No, I don't know. No, let's mine see. is let's very see. niche. Oh, oh okay, okay. okay. Yeah. I was guessing something else for you. Okay, okay. Yeah, you no. tell So me. mine, I saw an all-male Shakespeare company do Richard III set in a slaughterhouse. <laughs> Right, I listen, <laughs> I spent this whole play on the edge of my seat. I have never, like, I- It's set in a slaughterhouse. Yeah, so it was like themed in a slaughterhouse. And there's one point where like someone gets executed. So they send him behind like the plastic curtain and then a guy with a chainsaw went back there and like revved the chainsaw and then blood splattered across the curtain. Oh my goodness. It was incredible. And um, 
I'm not usually one to be like, oh yeah, all male Shakespeare, cool. But the the men who played women's parts didn't do a caricature of women. Mm. They just kind of played the parts honestly and the way they were dressed and everything, it really, um, you just forgot that they were a different gender. And it was really fun. Um, I didn't expect a history play to be so exciting. Um, and it made Richard III one of my favorite Shakespeare's plays. So. All time. Mm -hmm. you, you have a different answer, clearly. I, I like the comedy. <laughs> <laughs> The blood and the slaughter. I like the comedies. Um, I thought you were going to say Midsummer because I know that you directed yeah. Midsummer Night's Dream this summer. No, I did. I love Midsummer, but I'm listen. I'm a sword girl. I'm a fighter. Uh, girl. Yeah, yeah, I should. I should have. The rapier in the closet. A horse, a horse. My kingdom for right. a horse. Like that's that's it. The dagger in the office. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with Midsummer Night's Dream, yeah. which um, you know it has the beauty of kind of that midsummer feeling of seeing theater outdoors, right? The beauty of um, these magical, ridiculous, slightly vengeful fairies, you know, wreaking havoc on the human world. Um, but my absolute favorite part of Midsummer is that absurd play at the end yes. where the mechanicals put on Pyramus mm -hmm. and Fisbee and they do like a terrible job at it, right? They're playing the moon, they're playing the, you know, the wall. Um, and so in Rosewood, I actually have my characters put on an even worse, if you can imagine, <laughs> version of Pyramus and Thisbe where like the wall runs away with the moon and they run off stage and um, all sorts of shenanigans happen. Um, but I absolutely love those meta moments of plays within a play mm -hmm. in, um, in Shakespeare. And in fact, you know, in plenty of Austin novels, there's kind of family theatricals that happen. I love those moments where you're reading a book and then the characters are becoming characters and performing for mm -hmm. one another. Um, so I'm going to go with, yeah. with Midsummer, but in particular, the atrocious, yes. like, Pyramus and Thisbe performance. Yeah. They do Midsummer in That Self Same Metal, too, because, of course, there's Faye in the book. So there's right. a Oberon character, there's a Titania character, there's a Puck character. Um, and then you have this like meta moment of the uh, Joan and the Kingsmen performing Midsummer while under the threat of these like real life versions of these fa fairies who they're portraying. So, cool. yeah. And some of your characters are inspired by. Yeah. Midsummer. Yes, of course. Can you talk about how you develop your characters? Yeah, so um, my main character and her twin brother James are actually inspired by the twins from Twelfth Night mm -hmm. who are identical enough to swap places. So there's a moment where Joan and James swap places. Um, and I made their birthday January 6th, which is Twelfth Night and also Joan of Arc's birthday. Huge nerd, sorry y'all. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then uh, with- So intentional, which is- Right. I was, <laughs> So yeah, I'm like, yes, all these pieces, perfect. Easter eggs, everything. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, for the Fae in the book, I wanted to kind of lean into the, the like idea of like telling fairy tales as a, um, a method of making sure people behaved. So really leaning into the scarier aspects, the, um, the like nightmarish versions of what we see in Midsummer. Um, and with Shakespeare and Burbage, uh, Richard Burbage was one of the most famous actors of Shakespeare's time, and he was a member of the acting company along with Shakespeare. And my uh, kind of um, guiding light for them was this story of, uh, there was a performance they were doing of Richard III, Burbage was playing Richard, and a woman came to see it and loved it so much, she sent a message and asked him to come to her house after so they could do a little like private show and have a little good time. <laughs> <laughs> so he shows up at her house later and he sends word up and is like, tell her Richard III is here. And a message gets sent back down that says, William the Conqueror has come before Richard III because William Shakespeare beat him to the lady. So I'm like, the, okay, I was like, whenever I was trying to figure out like what Burbage or Shakespeare sounded like, I was like, okay, two guys who would do something like that and probably multiple times. So... <laughs> So that's it, yeah. And Sayatani, for your books, how much of your personal life, your experiences, family, play a factor, if at all? In fact, in this book, um, and it's a little difficult to talk about, but it's, it's the truth. I wrote about two sisters who are very differently grieving their father. Um, so, in, as you know, in Sense Sensibility, it kind of begins with Marianne and Eleanor's father passing away. Um, and so in my book, which I wrote, well before this happened to me, I'm writing about two sisters grieving their father. And 
unfortunately, my father really unexpectedly passed away this past January. And so it's been, and he was my number one fan. Like he, he was the one who looked up all the obscure articles about me. He's the one who had the Google alert on his email for me. He's the one who read every version of every tale. Um, and I can't help but feel his hand on me on my shoulder kind of as I've been touring with Rosewood, which is, you know, yes, it's a frothy, delightful family tale, but in a sense, it's also about like, how do you keep loving through grief? How do you keep living after something like that happens to you? And I don't know that answer yet, but, um, cause I'm still, you know, kind of deeply in that place of grieving, but I don't, I don't know. There's a part of me that that thinks like it can't, like I feel like it's my father being like, it's like here it is, like mm. it's okay. Um, it's okay, just keep following the book, keep following the story and like you'll make it to the other side. Mm. So. I'm so sorry for that. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize sharing. that I'd like, no, I'd no. say that and, and kind of tear up, but no. um, you know, all, your, all the pieces, they kind of, they show up in unexpected ways mm -hmm. and all your people show up in yeah. unexpected ways. Um, and so I feel like story is what keeps us going. For sure. Yeah. And talking about what keeps you going and the inspiration that, what, especially with both of you, it said representing women, women, women mm -hmm. of color in your stories as authors in this arena. Um, why is so important for you to write this book, to put yourself out there, and the challenges you face, and why you want to keep going forward? Um, yeah. So, like I said, I want um, anyone who feels like, or like 16 year old me feels excluded from this thing that they love so much. Um, I want them to know that people are lying to them. Like it's not, your exclusion isn't based on any truth or any fact. It's just because some people are extremely hateful. Um, it's not you, it's them. Uh, and I don't, um, oh, oh, right. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I think that deserves it. <laughs> Um, and uh, I also want to let, you know, the 16 year old girl who's questioning like, well, I, you know, I know I'm supposed to feel things for boys, but I don't know why I suddenly feel things for girls. Like, am I wrong? Am I weird? Is this like, is it bad? Is it whatever? Um, I want her to know and other queer kids to know, like, you are, yes, you are special and unique, but you're also absolutely normal. Um, and, uh, and perfect. Yes, yes. And perfect. Perfect and imperfect. Yeah. And, and yes. in that imperfection, <laughs> you are perfect. Um, and it's just, I, uh, I don't, I know what that feels like. I know the, the struggle of having so many people intentionally try to exclude you and people who you look up to and trust and want to believe. Mm. Um, so I just don't, I want to be a voice on the other side of that for, um, for, for kids. Um, and for adults too, uh, yeah. And I just, I, I know all the books I loved, nobody ever looked like me. Mm. Um, so right. in my imagination, I always was like, no, nah, okay, she's blonde, no, she's not, she's black. Um, <laughs> so I just wanna, I want people to have that book. You know, I want, I want black girls to have the book where they see themselves on the cover and they hear descriptions of themselves inside and they hear about their natural hair described as beautiful and wonderful and soft and, um, not like a tangle or uh, wild or mm. coarse or anything like that. Just like to see ourselves described in very loving terms and to also show a black girl who's loved and appreciated by everyone around her. Can I ask you the same thing, Sayantani? But you also work on We Need Diverse Books. So everything that Brittany just said, <laughs> um, every <laughs> single thing, um, it's, it's all of that. And here, I'll just read you the um, dedication to Debating Darcy, and I think it, it will just underline exactly what you just said. So the dedication to Debating Darcy and, you know, the 12-year-old me for whom I wrote it um, is like this. For all the brown girls who dreamt of gossamer gowns only to realize we were already wearing crowns. Right, so for all the brown girls who dreamt of gossamer gowns, that was me, right? Oh, I wish I, I wish I could be a part of that world. Oh, but I wouldn't be allowed in that ball, right? Um, only to realize we were already wearing crowns to kind of recognize and celebrate both this kind of a crown, right? And the kind of metaphorical crown. Um, and then the uh, sub-dedication. And for Colin Firth, for reasons that I hope are obvious. <laughs>
He's my Mark Darcy too. <laughs> no, Forever Matthew and McFadden. Oh, oh, you oh, like that? Oh, yes, oh, oh hold on. Really? Hold on. Somebody get me a rapier. Whoa. Wait, okay. wait. Listen. <laughs> hold this on, is going to be on. the debate of the century. Yes. <laughs> I love Matthew McFadden. Right, right, I do. Hold on. No, I. But Colin Firth is. Oh, okay. Wow. Right? Somebody's. Right? I'm. I'm somebody. You take off your sword earrings. We're oh, going out. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, and look what happened to Matthew McFadden's career. My goodness gracious. Yeah. Right. Right. And same with Colin Firth, though. Yeah, no. yeah. Indeed, indeed. Indeed. So, but all the things you said, all jokes aside, and Colin Firth, Matthew McFadden will be happening out in the hallway. Right. <laughs> we'll be having a you. showdown in the sign. Right, right. right. Part two. Um, but everything you said, everything you said, and um, making room and making welcome. Mm hmm. Um, and just loving our past selves so that we can yes. love all the young readers coming up after us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we know that this is part of a saga. Yes. Right? It's part, it's book one of a trilogy. Right. Can yes. you talk, a, give us a little preview about, oh Lord. Um, a little bit, yeah. just a little. So, uh, yeah, so the. fracture. <laughs> so book two in the, this is, this is a, I've told my newsletter subscribers, but I'll tell y'all here, we're all friends here. Y'all look here. <laughs> Uh, book two in the series, to her news. right, is called Saint Seducing Gold. Uh, and in this book, it picks up immediately after book one ends. And uh, Joan finds herself drawn more into this um, impending war between the Fae and the mortal realm. Uh, and whereas before she was able to experience the comforts of home, now she finds herself pulled into the court of uh, King James I, um, the quintessential chaotic bisexual. Um, that's historical fact, I try. <laughs> um, she does her research. Right. <laughs> so uh, she, she has to fight, um, she has to figure out how she's gonna fight from within the court uh, under the watchful eyes of the king who was a very notorious witch hunter. So how do you practice your magic under the eye of someone who is immediately ready to burn you at the stake mm. for being a witch? Uh, and in book one, she kind of makes enemies with the Secretary of State, Robert Cecil, who's also the king's spy master. So because she's at court, she's also under his watch as well. So she has to deal with not only the conflicts of the Fey realm, Fey realm but also these very mortal uh, issues that she can't take to with her sword. Wow. Yeah. Very exciting. And, we'll, yes. and there's going to be... That's the second one. And yeah, so book three, and three. I'm actually writing book three right now, y'all. Oh, you so, are? Yeah, okay. so. Now you know that, okay. Right, so we'll all find out together what's happening in book three. <laughs> and book two comes out when? Uh, book two comes out April 30th, 2024, so. Now, do you, Hassan Tani, have another Jane Austen book that you want to kind of turn on its head? Do you have one in mind already? Are you writing one already? I, I do, but I'd love to take an audience poll. Oh, yay. Because there are two, I won't reveal yet, till we hear them. Okay. Um, any votes for Emma? Emma, oh, all right, we have some Emma fans, all right. How about, uh, what were the other ones? How, uh, votes for Northanger. Oh, we only have a couple. I love Northanger, it's so weird. Um, <laughs> Right, it's the one about like she's in love with the gothic novels. Like, yeah. right? I, I kind of love that one. Um, I am uh, not going to do Mansfield Park. I am so sorry, no, okay. but unless I can figure out a way to make Fanny Price less perfect, um, <laughs> I'm not going to do. Uh, uh, wait, I'm missing one. Um, persuasion, persuasion votes. We, okay. Oh, I feel like that was an even between Emma, Emma and Persuasion. And Persuasion. Mm -hmm. That's tough. Um, so yes, I have been both uh, playing around with a Northanger. Thank you, one person who voted. Uh, <laughs> right. From we'll over know, there. We'll know more about it when you it, write it. Exactly. Right. Um, and an Emma, which I think matches my kind of mm -hmm. uh, delight in sarcastic voice better, probably. <laughs> um, but uh, so thank you for voting. Um, I will keep persuasion in mind um, as I continue to work. But yes, they're freestanding books. Um, but certainly with each one, I am trying to both draw from and draw from these original Austins and kind of build unique contemporary stories. What about the other series in your books? Oh, so I have um, a new middle grade series that is out right now uh, called Secrets of the Sky. And it is an echo fantasy series for kind of younger readers. So um, we have 10 year old twin protagonists their flying horse friends, their rainbow winged flying horse dog uh, going off on intergalactic adventures, but solving kind of 
um, ecologically inspired fantasy. So, uh, you know, the mermaids can't live in the water because of acid rain, the bees are missing, why, those kinds of things. Um, but that's an entirely different you know, audience than the Jane Austen audience. But the first book, The Chaos Monster, just came out. The second book, The Poison Waves, is coming out in October. And the third book, The Ghost Forest, is out in April, I think. All right. So we promised that we would leave time for questions. I love that you put the audience to the poll about oh. the book. Right. That was so fun. <laughs> there are two microphones here. If you have any questions for either of the authors, please form lines or come on up and ask questions at the microphones. Um, in the meantime, I'll ask you about uh, writing processes because I know that there are people in the audience who want to be budding writers. And reading these books and the thought process into the characters and the, the imagination world, it's really daunting. Anytime you think, oh, I have something to say, I'm like, oh, never mind. I can't, <laughs> you, can, I read, you can't do it. Um, how, what advice would you give? Um, I'd say uh, let your first draft be ugly. It's totally okay. Um, a, a lot of it, a lot of advice I've seen says like the first draft is you telling yourself the story. The first draft's only job is to exist, um, and then from there you refine it through edits and revision. Um, when I the first draft of that self same metal was only thirty four thousand words long, uh, and this final version is seventy eight thousand words. So the story grew within me, you know, revising it and figuring it out. So um, yeah, just let your first draft be rough and ugly. Don't bring judgment to the page um, until you go to edit. Then you can be judge all you want. Then you can be very harsh. Um, but yeah, just, just get the words down. And it's okay if you don't write every day. Just write when you can and be kind to yourself and yeah. You were a pediatrician yeah. and you became a writer. I mean, yeah. those talk about b both brains. Right. But but also, you know, being a pediatrician and then a professor and, you know, I'm still a professor and now a writer, but it's all, it's all kind of, you know, young people's physical health, their intellectual health, their imaginative health, like it's all kind of, a, for me, it comes from the same place. Um, it's kind of looking after young people in all those ways um, and being inspired by young people in all those ways. And the only you know, additional piece of advice I would say is, you know, listen, listen to, to when in doubt, listen to Toni Morrison. Um, <laughs> I mean, right, that's, always. That's really great advice. Period. Right. Um, but who tells us, right, that if there's a book you want to read and it hasn't been written yet, you must write it. Mm -hmm. You have the responsibility, but also the power to do so. Um, and, you know, nobody can write your story. Even if I gave you all a writing assignment right now, you would all write it differently mm -hmm. because you all have different perspectives, identities, life experiences. No one can tell your story but you. Um, so, you know, give yourself permission to do so, I think. Any questions before I yes, here? Please uh, come on up. <laughs> First off, I want to say thank you as an educator and a lover of classics. Uh, thank you for removing barriers for my students because it's so wonderful to watch them fall in love in a new way with stories that I've gotten to love because I'm fortunate enough to be in them. Um, and I had two, two questions. One, you mentioned uh, a book that you came across in your research. Yes. Uh, and what was that again? It was called Labor's Lost. Labor's Lost. Yeah, I okay. can't remember the author right now, but I'll, I'll tweet it out. I'll, oh, put it, I'll put it on social media. Awesome. I'll put my whole bibliography up. I got you. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Uh, and then second, do you guys have a favorite retelling that you love? Great question. I, I love, this is, I know, so books wise, I love the um, Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson oh. Levine, like love that. That's like book of my heart, loved it. Um, but when it comes specifically to Shakespeare, my favorite Shakespeare retelling is She's the Man because it's a, <laughs> it's a very accurate 12th night retelling. And it's so like queen, queen, millennial queen, Amanda Bynes, like great. It's a, it's a great movie. It's so accurate to both the like, energy of the play, the spirit of the play, and to the plot of the play. Um, and so, yeah, those are my, my two favorite retellings. Oh, I love that. <laughs> um, no, and, and you know that as an author, this is a true fact, anytime someone says, oh, you know, what's the latest book you read or what's a recommend, like my mind goes entirely, you asked me that question, I was like, what? <laughs> um, like, what is a book? Which is why I let Brittany answer first. <laughs> um, but I will, I'm gonna go with Clueless Ooh. as, like, oh, it so so stands up so well as an Emma retelling. Yes, I went back so and I recently watched it. 
Man, it stands up. It's really good. It's really good. So if you haven't rewatched Clueless in a while, go watch it. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Such great answers. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, yeah. Once again, thank you both for writing the books that you write. Um, it makes me excited and, you know, to potentially have kids one day <laughs> so that they can read your books. Um, you know, both of you have mentioned your family. Um, uh, Shantani, you mentioned your dad. And I was wondering if you could share any core memories you have of your families and what they did to cultivate um, love of literature mm -hmm. in your life, in your childhood. Um, and maybe I can, you know, take some of that as advice for when I share your books with my future kids. Of course. Um, so when I was in practice as a pediatrician, um, and this isn't me, many pediatricians and family practitioners do this, we would write prescriptions for reading. Um, you would write on a page, you know, just like you would write amoxicillin for an ear infection, you would write, um, you know, read out loud to your kids 20 minutes a day. And you would hand not just the prescription, but then the means to do it, uh, an age, you know, and hopefully culturally um, kind of uh, appropriate book to the family. And so I think that being read aloud to whether or not you can read, um, you know, even as an older child that you can read yourself, being read aloud to is such a powerful family activity. Um, even if you're, you know, all, you know, adults and you're reading something out aloud together as folks would do kind of pre-television and you know pre-radio. Um, I think it's an incredibly powerful activity. I went to a lot of um, summer Shakespeare before I was even able to understand what was happening and was just caught up in the delight of it. So I, I did get to experience a lot of kind of outdoor theater. Um, and tried to continue that tradition with my own family as well. Um, we actually live in a town where there's a children's Shakespeare company um, that my own children are involved in grade four on. Um, so I would say, you know, be, read aloud, make, make that as kind of reading a not only individual activity, but a community activity. And then I would say there are arts that are accessible like outdoor Shakespeare, like community theater, um, like library programs, like make use of those beautiful, beautiful um, community arts programs. Yeah, I, um, I will say that my family uh, encouraged my reading all through life. Um, my uh, aunt and my grandmother, they found um, this collection of fairy tales, uh, picture books drawn with black characters written by this writer and illustrator, Fred Crump Jr. or Fred Crump III, I can't quite remember. Um, so I got to read all of the like Beauty and the Beast and Cinderella and Rapunzel with, and be able to look at these pictures of black characters. Mm. So that really kind of, um, that was very foundational for me. Um, I was reading uh, by, like when I started school, I was already reading on a first grade level. So we were like a very much reading based house. Right now, my son, he's not quite two yet and we read to him every night. Um, we've been reading to him since, you know, before he could see more than a foot in front of his face. Um, and we've also taken him to see theater. He's seen um, what uh, two plays so far. He's seen, um, he saw Midsummer three times when I directed it and enjoyed it. Didn't fall asleep until the last 20 minutes, but he loved it. Um, had a great time, so I think, um, yeah, just sharing every sharing the things you love with your kids. I share the books that I loved as a kid with him, and that's really great. Um, he has his own favorites that we read over and over again. Um, we let him just look at the pages and the pictures, even though he doesn't quite understand the words yet. But just, yeah, find, there's so many books out there, we don't have to force like specific things on kids anymore. Just meet your kids where they are with what, they, what they'll enjoy, what they love. And it's when you get to school and they start making you read things that you don't identify with or you don't like, or that like feels dry or not exciting, that's when you start to lose yeah. the love of reading. So really listen to your kids, talk to your kids, explore different things with your kids and let them know there's this huge world of books out there. So if you don't like this, fine, we'll try that. If you don't like that, we'll try something else until you find what, what your kids really like. Because I, I had some books, man. And Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut used to make you read all the time. Oh, we did. Do they still have those programs at all anywhere? I they love those programs. But, uh, you know, so and and celebrate and protect your local libraries. Yes. Love right? Libraries. Yes. In this day and age, for sure. Well, we have another question. 
Well, I just want to say, I swear I learned to read early because my mother read too slowly. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to get through the story faster. Uh, and I just wanted to let you know, uh, I believe it's Natasha Korda, Labor's Lost, Thank Women's you. Work in the Early Modern English That's Theater. That's it. That's the book. Thank yes. you so much. Yes. Thank and you. I also had a question for you, because I'm just intrigued by this thought of the rapier in the closet. Yeah. Do you write uh, scenes specifically with sword fights because you know it so well? Yes, because I love it. It's, it, I just, I, I couldn't. One's say. hobbies do inform one's yes. writing. Yes. yes, absolutely. This is all the things that I love. Shakespeare, um, sword fights, and uh, yeah, really cute love interests and <laughs> all the good stuff. Fairies and fairy tales and like <laughs> evil fae and yeah, it's, yeah. Like Thank I had you. to do a lot of research for my sword fight scene. <laughs> I do not have a rapier in my closet. <laughs> Hi, this Hi. is a question for Brittany. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a Catholic, and I was wondering if your character, Joan, is based on St. Joan of Arc. Um, very, she's inspired by St. Joan of Arc. Um, I live in New Orleans, and so Joan of Arc is uh, huge in New Orleans. We have this giant gold statue of her. There's a, her um, birthday starts the Mardi Gras season, so it start, she's the first parade of the Mardi Gras season where they parade to the church and they have someone portray Joan of Arc, have her sword blessed and everything, and then they continue to the statue. So that was definitely in my mind as I was creating her. I named her Joan because of um, Joan of Arc being this like subversive um, figure in English history because she fought for the French against the English. Um, that's why I, part of the reason why I made her and her brother's birthday on January 6th. Um, although now every time I say it, my brain goes a totally different direction, right, which right. I January hate it. <laughs> I wrote it before that happened. So I'm like, you know what? We stick into our guns. That's right. Um, and uh, also, you know, similar, similarly to how Catholics had to exist in this period in England, um, Joan and her family have to hide certain aspects of their religious practice because it was, um, you had to be visibly Protestant uh, under King James. Um, so it's like all of that is kind of informed by, by Joan of Arc and inspired. Okay. Um, was there anything else that drew you to this uh, St. Joan of Arc in particular? Um, I played her in a production um, and I really, I hate how Shakespeare writes her in the, the latter half of Henry the Sixth, part one. Um, so I just kind of wanted to lean into the more heroic side instead of the like English propaganda side of what Joan of Arc is. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're, we're almost out of time, but real quick, I know people like to know, um, what are you reading right now? If you have time? <laughs> Um, I'm actually reading Rosewood. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> right. I'm into it. I'm into it. I'm really, I'm really having a great time um, as an actor and as an actor who loves Shakespeare and stuff. And as like a girly girl who's like, oh, yes, I love it. <laughs> so it's, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's oh, great. <laughs> thank you. I, I just, I just read your book, um, and I just read. Um, so I'm really just intrigued. There's a lot of books lately out about. Um, examining this idea of translation and what does it mean mm -hmm. to translate. Um, so I read Babel, R.F. Kuang, I read Yellowface, and then I'm reading The Center, which is also kind of about like what does it mean to be able to speak multiple languages. And I think those of us you know who do um, know that there's a power there and know that um, there's kind of a multiplicity of identity that that is kind of our secret power is our. our you know, our secret weapon. And I'm just intrigued that um, there are multiple books out right now kind of exploring this issue. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. I've had such a wonderful time talking to both Sai and Tani and Brittany. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you to the audience for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we give a round of applause yes. to our ASL? Yes.